<laughs> You'll notice that uh, I'll, I'll moderate this with a thick French, French accent. Uh, I, I just haven't been able to l lose it after 40 years. My French is rustier than Titanic, <laughs> but I still have this damn accent. I, I hope these fellows can teach me how to lose my accent. I'm going to uh, start by asking, uh, first by reading uh, a short bio from uh, these four gentlemen, and then we will uh, ask them for their first thoughts, three to four minutes uh, each. They may have some comments after that to one another that we'll, they will share with us, and then we will open the floor for Q&A. So to my immediate right is Mark Okrand, who devised the Vulcan dialogue heard in Star Star Trek, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and later developed the Klingon language and coached the actors using it in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, uh, in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered count Country. The contributed Klingon dialogue to several uh, episodes of Star Trek, The Next Generation, and the later Star Trek television series and he created Romulan and Vulcan dialogue for the 2009 Star Trek film. Okran is the author of uh, three books about Klingon, The Klingon Dictionary, first published in, in 1985, The Klingon Way, 1996, and Klingon for the Galactic Traveler, 1997. To Mark's right is Paul Frommer, the linguist who developed the Navi language for James Cameron's film Avatar. I hope I'm pr pronouncing this correctly. And he's Professor Emeritus of Clinical Management Communication and for former director of the Center for Management Communication at U USC's Marshall School of Business. Prior to joining Marshall, he lived and taught in Malaysia in Iran and spent 10 years in the business world as vice president and strategic pl planner for a Los Angeles corporation. His teaching at USC included courses in advanced writing for business and cross-cultural cross business communication for non-native speakers. That's me. Since the release of Avatar, Navi has attracted a worldwide community of enthusiasts who are assisting Dr. Frommer in expanding the language further. In addition to Navi, he also developed the Martian language for Disney, the Disney film John Carter. He is co-author with Edward Finnegan of Looking at Languages, a workshop in elementary linguistics. To uh, Paul's right is Doug Vakosh, uh, the director of Interstellar Message Composition at the SETI Institute as well as the only social scientist employed by a SETI organization. He investigates how one might craft um, messages that could be transmitted across interstellar space and could serve to permit communication between humans and extraterrestrials even without face-to-face -face contact. He's particularly interested in how we might compose messages that would begin to express what it's like to be human. And finally, but not certainly not least, uh, to, to the right of Doug, is Frank Drake, who conducted the first modern SETI experiment in 1960, continues his lifetime, lifelong interest in the detection of uh, extraterrestrial sanctional life. He participates in an ongoing search for optical signals of intelligent origin carried out with colleagues from uh, Lick Observatory and the University of California at Berkeley using the 40-inch nickel telescope at Lick. Frank also continues to investigate radio telescope designs that optimize the chances of success for SETI. He proposed a plan used in the design of the Allen Telescope Array based on some of his works of more than 40 years ago. He's also interested in the possibility that the very numerous red dwarf stars, stars that are much less bright than the sun, might also host habitable planets. Now before I actually turn the floor, I have the pleasant duty to remind you that there is a table across the, in, across the hall there where you can purchase a DVD for each of the sessions that were given for the last two days. 
And I will remind you that, otherwise I'll be penalized again at the end of this session. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Mark, if you will uh, give us a, a brief in intro of your initial thoughts on this, please. I'm glad I'm going first. Last time I was glad I was going last, but this time I'm glad I'm going first because I, th I think you know, the, the top of this is how to create uh, an alien language. And thinking of who else is sitting to my right and what they're doing, it gets more and more complex mm -hmm. as, as we go in that direction. I got the easy part because I had to create an alien language for American actors. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the idea for, for Klingon, I might as well start with, with Klingon. Um, was, was to come up with some kind of dialogue that sounded alien. Now, it wasn't going to really be alien in, in, the, in the sense, as I said, I was joking about the American actors, but it's true, is it had to be pronounced by human beings um, and not electronically enhanced or anything like that. Uh, the, the thinking was the actors would really say this stuff on the set and that would be, that would be the end of that. No tapes playing backwards or anything. Uh, so the, the thinking was to come up with something that didn't sound like anything else. It had to sound like a, a different language. And the goal was more different from anything anybody ever heard as, a, as opposed to something from outer space. Um, for the reasons I just said, because, because these guys had to, had to say this. Not only did they have to say it, they had to remember it, which was even harder. Um, so what I did in, in looking at this and trying to figure out how to do it was look at a, at a few sources. Fortunately, I wasn't first with Klingon. Uh, there was a little tiny bit, maybe half a dozen lines in the first Star Trek movie. Uh, those, some of you know this already, you know, were made up by James Doohan, who didn't get credit for that for a long, long time, although, although eventually he did. Um, and they were spoken, the, the first actor in that movie who spoke them was a guy named Mark Leonard, who normally played a Sarek, who was Spock's father. So the true origins of the Klingon language is that it was created by a Federationeer and spoken by a Vulcan. Um, <laughs> Klingons are very upset when I say that. Um, uh, nevertheless, that was the start. So those, those half a dozen lines had to be incorporated into whatever I did. And then going above and beyond that, I looked for sounds and grammatical structures and things like that that were weird, but not impossible. Uh, and by weird, I don't mean that they're not found anywhere or anything like that. I mean that they don't go together. There's nothing in Klingon that you can't find somewhere else. Uh, but the combination of sounds and the combination of grammatical features, I hope, uh, you can't find anywhere else. And that was, that was the approach to making it sound strange and alien. The reason for doing it at all, it wasn't my idea to do it, to do it in the first place, it was, the, it was the writers and the producers of the film, the reason for doing it at all was to give the Klingons uh, a special uh, personality and characteristic to make them seem more different than they already looked, uh, and to bring some, some kind of more, uh, to, to more reality uh, to the picture, to, to in this case Star Trek III and the ones, that, the ones that came after that. The idea being that if these people had a, had a different culture, different beliefs, different everything else, they should sound different as well and talk different as well. And that's where, that's where the idea came from. So we just wanted, wanted to do that. And the, the, the thought initially was that what I was doing was the same as the, as, as the prop designers or the costume designers or something like that. In this case, giving them a sound, those guys gave them a look that was different and served the purposes of the film. The whole idea that people started speaking it and carrying on conversations in it and things like that came much afterwards. We'll talk about that later. Uh, my partner in crime here and I have had some very interesting conversations and com kind of comparing notes. And it's amazing how similar our experiences have been. Uh, in the case of Avatar, constructing an alien language was very much a question of who's paying you to do it and what do they want? And so sort of giving, giving them kind of what they hired you to do. Um, James Cameron was interested in a language for Pandora that would be, I remember he said, it should sound nice, possibly in contradistinction to the Klingon, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and it should sound complicated. Now, I don't know how you make something sound complicated, I think the language is fairly complicated. Uh, I didn't start from absolute zero because he had actually come up with about 30 words in the original, what he calls a script mint. Um, most of these were place names, names of characters and such. So I kind of took a look at that, got a sense of the kind of sound he had in mind and expanded out from that. Um, early on, we had our most, uh, our most salient interaction early in the process. 
And I particularly wanted to come up with a sound for the language that he would be happy with. And I tried various things. Um, I, I did something which seemed to work pretty well. I constructed what I called sound palettes. So early on, I just wrote out some nonsense stuff which had no structure, no syntax, but would allow him to hear various possibilities for the sound of the language. And um, for example, I, I tried tone. Okay, and I have some pretty exaggerated tones. Uh, I had people go, you know, which might be different from, he didn't like that. And one of the things I, I, I uh, got to understand is that he was very concerned that there not be too much distance between the audience and the Navi, because the greater the distance, uh, he felt, uh, the less you would relate to them as people that you really cared about. So he didn't like that. He didn't like distinctive vowel length, difference between, say, da, da, and da, which could be a possibility. But he did like um, something I added, which was called ejectives. Sounds like un, ed, a, which are found in human languages uh, in lots of Native American languages and um, Ethiopia and Central Asia and so on. So um, I kind of expanded out from that. So, tried to come up with something which would sound unique, uh, would have a challenging structure for people who wanted to investigate it, uh, which would be pronounceable by the actors, which was really important, uh, which would be learnable, because part of the story was that human beings have actually learned this language, and that says something to a linguist. It says the language probably has a certain structure, it can do certain things, and it probably better not do other things, because humans can never learn to speak it. Um, expanded about the grammar. Um, I did something, I think, similar to what, to what you did, Mark. I was influenced by the languages which I was familiar with. It was kind of inevitable. So parts of the grammar sound a little bit like Hebrew, and another corner is reminiscent of something in Chinese, and another corner is reminiscent of something in Persian, and so on. But the combination, I think, is unique. You know, when, when we think about language uh, in SETI, in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we often uh, use it uh, almost as a metaphor. So we'll, we'll talk about things uh, like a universal language. And, and one of the analogies we draw is that um, as we try to figure out how to create a message that might be understandable, we want to find something like uh, an interstellar Rosetta Stone. Um, you may recall the Rosetta Stone was the slab of basalt that was found in, in northern Egypt, 1799. And it was the key to Europeans recovering an understanding of uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, because the same text was written uh, in uh, Egyptian uh, scripts and in Greek. And they knew the Greek, and so when they could drop parallels between the two, they could make a connection. Now, when we think about uh, what a cosmic Rosetta Stone might be like, we'll, we'll often think about things like uh, uh, the periodic table of elements, something that scientists on other worlds might know about too by investigating the same physical universe. Because we don't assume uh, they're going to know any English or Swahili or Klingon or Navi. Uh, and, and so then the question is, what, what do we use? So when we talk about language in SETI, we usually don't talk about it as literally language, but more the language of science or trying to find a, the language of, of mathematics. But I think in ways, you know, one of the things I like about this session is that it, it makes me stop and say, have we missed something? And I, I'd like to suggest that perhaps we have, and we haven't gone far enough in thinking about how we could actually uh, embed natural language in future uh, interstellar messages. And I think we actually have a very nice precedent in this uh, that was established over 50 years ago in, I, I believe it was the first interstellar message that you designed back in 1960. You, maybe you'd have done some other sketches. This is after the first SETI conference, um, Frank created a message for the participants to see could they really decode something. So it was a sheet of paper that had 551 ones and zeros on it. And 
if you looked at it closely enough, it, one of the participants was able to figure out, well, oh, this is actually two prime numbers, 29 um, by 19. And if you, if you um, put that in a two-dimensional array, you get a picture. So the parts of the picture, it's actually very similar to another message that um, was transmitted that Frank also designed uh, a little over a decade later that was transmitted from, uh, from Arecibo, Puerto Rico. But this first message was from a hypothetical alien. But a lot of the same elements were there as in other messages that have gone out. Uh, so there's a description that astronomers on other worlds might understand, a description of its solar system, pictorial uh, images of its solar system, accounting system, uh, uh, schematic depictions of a couple of elements critical to the biochemistry of that organism, carbon and oxygen. But there's one part of that message that so often goes neglected, and it's language as we usually think about it, because underneath this picture of an individual, uh, there's kind of a, a, a squat biped that's being depicted. Underneath it, there are four bits. And that four bits is, is meant to represent the name of that individual. And that's something that we haven't really developed. Now, would that, would that was those four bits, those, those four black pulses, four black squares, would they be understood as a name in that picture? Probably not. But I mean, the, that wasn't the point of this message. It was to, to get a general idea of how might you make a very compact message but in the real world of transmissions, we're not constrained to something that condensed. And, and so what, what, what I'd like to suggest is this idea that Frank proposed over 50 years ago is one that we should explore and develop even more. So he used it to suggest, here's an object, the name of this creature. But we might also have in the same place on every grid uh, another series of, of symbols that indicate something that when there's a change in the images. And so maybe that indicates a verb, and, and maybe there's another section that describes how this change happens, so it's an adverb. And so I think in that process, we actually start explaining to an extraterrestrial something about um, how we carve up and describe the world, because fundamentally, language is our way of, of summarizing what we see about the world. And as we look at how different languages uh, around the world carve up this generally shared reality that we have, we see that there are a lot of ways of doing it. And I think that's perhaps one of the most critical uh, messages that linguistics has for interstellar message design. Simply a reminder that there are a lot of ways to describe the same thing out there. Uh, and so if we really want to have messages that might be understandable, to think about tapping into that uh, richness and, and perhaps even having messages in the future um, that include some of the wondrous flexibility of language. Because one of the great things about language is, you know, in a, in a few symbols, in the case of English, 26 letters, we combine them in, in all of these infinite combinations and we're say, able to say something so rich in very few characters. <clears throat> well, following on, on Doug's comments, uh, the first two speakers were uh, dealing with oral languages uh, in communicating with aliens. And in our business, we have on several occasions wanted to send messages to extraterrestrial creatures on other worlds and in one area to humans, not of this century, but 10,000 years from now. So what I'm going to talk about is what we came up with when we we're faced with dealing with the demands that are created by making an, a, an effective language which communicates, but also communicates clearly to people <coughs> or creatures with which you have no common history or common language. And that's the problem we face. No common history, no common language. Uh, I, when it came to sending messages, <coughs> to extraterrestrial civilizations, uh, it was immediately obvious that oral languages would not work. In every case, we are limited in the amount of material we can send. There's not enough material to give a whole language course. And um, messages in 
brief messages in oral languages simply will not work because there's no material there to, to use as a dictionary, if you will, to convert, uh, to recognize what the sounds mean in the way of verbs, nouns, and what have you. Uh, there is an exception to this in what we did on the Voyager record, which I'm going to talk to you about later. On that record, we did put messages in human oral languages, knowing full well that the extraterrestrials probably would understand none of this. Uh, however, uh, politics gets, gets in there, and NASA wanted some messages in there, and greetings in human languages, and they're there. To, to mystify the extraterrestrials, that's why they're, that's why they're there. <clears throat> uh, if any of you want to hear one of the oral messages that are on the Voyager record, I don't have it here, but the per one of the people whose voice is on the uh, <clears throat> Voyager record is in the audience, and she would be glad to repeat her message <laughs> to you when I'm through here. <laughs> Uh, if you insist, I, I won't identify her. Maybe she doesn't want to be, you know. Anyway, uh, uh, well, I, I mentioned the uh, messages we sent to outer space. There, w <clears throat> there is another set of messages which has received no publicity, which required a lot of study by linguists, archaeologists, historians, paleontologists, and these were messages which were to be warning signs to be placed at radioactive waste disposal sites around the world. And it was thought that these had to be labeled in some way that they would be recognized as hazardous to be avoided for the time periods that it takes for the radioactive materials in them to decay. And that's typically 10,000 years. So some of us, and there were actually two teams established by the Atomic Energy Commission to establish a message system which had to work for human beings now, not Klingons or Vulcans or anything else, but for human beings, but human beings 10,000 years in the future. Now you might think, well, that's easy. You just print a sign, you know, beware, radioactive ass waste buried here. Uh, <coughs> but the, uh, <coughs> the historians and linguists and all told us this was not going to work because if you look at history, human languages change almost completely in a typical time period of 400 years. That's what we were told. In other words, if any of us went back to, to somehow by time travel to Elizabethan times in England, we would not understand the English that was being spoken at that time. And so even uh, spoken languages would not work Similarly, written languages would not work except possibly those used in religious texts because those are preserved. For instance, today we still have people who can easily read Latin because it's a, it, it plays a part in the liturgy, uh, liturgy of many uh, Christian faiths. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, faced with dealing with these things, in, in, in both cases, it was recognized that oral languages was not a good way <clears throat> to communicate. <clears throat> and what was, uh, what does, can be made to work is to use pictures. You know, after all, this is how young children, babies learn how to talk. They are shown things, they're told its name, and in this way they learn language. And pictures can work when there is no common language or common history. But even there, you must be very careful, uh, which I will get to. But the point here is that pictures can work as a language between, uh, that communicates between creatures who are very different, between a, a hominid such as us and perhaps an intelligent octopus on some other planet. They can work, whereas oral language and even written language will not work. Uh, Pierre, I have a, a whole assortment of pictures from the Voyager record here to demonstrate the problems, but did, shall I do it now or do you want to uh, continue otherwise? Well, we can do that in, uh, just before the Q&A. Does that work for you? That's fine. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question for the panel. Uh, I mean, obviously, communication, if we talk about oral communication, is actually a very chauvinistic way of thinking about communicating. I'm sure there are, and I'd like to hear from all of you, uh, 
you know, did you ever have a director come to you and say, I'd like to have a communication that has nothing to do with oral communication. You can communication through MIME, through electromagnetic ESP. There are many ways of doing it. Is there anything universal about communication that you can talk to us about? Beginning, the question was easier. Um, actually, I did give some thought to, to some kind of communication that was not oral communication, not just talking like I'm, like I'm doing right now. Uh, because there's lots of other things you could do. Uh, since we're dealing with outer space folks, right, it doesn't have to be through the sense of, of, of noise and hearing and stuff like that. It could be something else. The obvious ones are, are sight, so you know, some kind of sign language or something. Um, but it could also be smell or, or, or something else. For purposes of Star Trek, which is, what I, which is what I was doing. As, as we know, every, not every, but virtually every alien creature, at least every alien creature that, that communicates uh, has two legs and two arms and a funny nose and talks. Uh, so so I, was, I was constrained not, not by my vision of, of, of the way things are possible, but by the way the stories work and things like that. I I've, I've actually have a, lot of, I have a number of deaf friends who are very upset with me that these guys are talking uh, rather than signing. Uh, but that's all I could do. But yeah, no, I, I, I did think, how, how, is there another way we can do this? But for purposes of, again, for the task at hand, it was not the, not the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, if you let your imagination go, you can imagine a lot of interesting communication systems that are not based uh, on the visual, or rather the, uh, the uh, oral auditory channel. Um, there's a group called the Language Creation Society uh, made up of hobbyists who just create languages for the fun of it. And um, I mentioned this morning at the Fireside Chat, uh, there's one language creator who has come up with a language based on touch where uh, it's, it's, it's well-structured, it has, it has morphology, it has syntax, and um, you can actually hold hands with your significant other and, and speak this way, which is kind of fun. So, so the channel is not really key. There, there are certain design features of language which are probably gonna, gonna be um, valid across the board. There was a linguist um, named Charles Hockett about 50 years ago who came up with a set of design features for, he, he tried to make it specific to human language, but a lot of them, um, I think are relevant to any, any, any rich communication system. For example, the idea of discreteness and productivity, which is to say a language seems to need to be based on discrete elements, a finite set of discrete elements, which have meaning attached to them, which can be combined in a potentially infinite number of ways. So you can list the number of words in a language. I mean, you know, that's what dictionaries are for. You cannot list the number of sentences in a language. And so the idea of using finite means for infinite production by combining them in different patterns seems to be a feature of language. And I think, uh, I think the general study of this is, is, is semiotics. And, and this, I think, would be relevant to looking at Nonverbal communication systems. If I could follow up with some ideas from semiotics, um, what we've been talking about with language, you know, when, when we think of words, um, for most of those words, it's really arbitrary what we use. You know, we say the moon or la lune, and it's not connected to this particular object. Uh, and so there's an arbitrary connection between. Uh, what semioticians call the sign and, and what it stands for. Uh, so the word and the thing it stands for. But there are other types of signs that there's actually a connection. Uh, and so one type of those is called an icon. There's some physical resemblance. So you can think we're very visual creatures. So we think of visual icons uh, like a a uh, skull and crossbones is an icon for danger. There's a connection between, you know, drink this and you'll die. But because we're so uh, very visually oriented, I think it's nice to, to stop and think of signs that beings who rely on other senses uh, might use. Because 
aliens may not rely on vision and, uh, as much as we do. A, a great example for me uh, is uh, there's this innocuous little fly, uh, Dolico vespula arenaria. Uh, but the beautiful thing about this fly from its perspective is all of its potential predators veer away from it. And it's not because it looks like anything dangerous, but because the frequency of its wing flapping is virtually identical to a very dangerous wasp. So that f innocuous fly is giving off an auditory icon. There's a resemblance between this message that it's emitting and a message uh, that really has a very impactful meaning. Now, it's not, it d that doesn't give the kind of flexibility uh, of these uh, arbitrary connections and, and a full language. Um, but I, I think, Pierre, your original question was not just about language, but communication systems. And so I think as we think in terms of SETI, you know, the other thing that we, that we assume when we start thinking about language is what's something that's going to flow out over time. Uh, but the uh, picture, as Frank was saying, is something that, yeah, it takes time to kind of absorb the whole thing in, but the whole thing's there in front of you at once. And so we might remove that temporal component, too, if we want to think about other ways of making messages. Frank, it might be a good time for you to, to show your... <clears throat> okay, I, I want to really talk about the use of pictures as uh, a way of communicate with extra communicating with extraterrestrials. Let me get this thing... <clears throat> Is there an image on the screen? No. no go on. Takes a while, you may. Yeah. It should be. It's here. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> I should have left it on. Yeah. Um, wait a minute. I'm going to have to. Talk about something else. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a session. There is a meeting that's held every year called the Contact Conference. And uh, they have, in the months building up to it, uh, two teams uh, inventing different uh, civilizations. And then they come together for the conference. And, and one year when they did this, they came together, were ready to have this big yeah. encounter, and they discovered one of them used Mac and the other used PC. And so they, <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't able to make the contact. I think it's, it's very humbling when we think about the challenges <laughs> to make contact with extraterrestrials uh, when we need to grapple with these technological uh, yeah, challenges right here. But we have an image right here. Have we got it? Okay. Okay, you can start the, the show. Okay. Uh, we've got it now. Well, while they're finagling that, I just want to ask one last question. Uh, oh, I can do it now. Uh, there's one fellow, a good buddy of mine at NASA. His name is Jeff Scargill, and he's one of the top mathematicians no. over there. Oh. But he does not believe in platonic numbers. In other words, he believes that mathematics uh, is purely yeah, a human yeah. invention. And I find that extraordinarily bizarre. Now, if it's true that uh, music is, in, uh, is invented and not discovered, which is what I believe, then how can we communicate even with numbers uh, across space? Because then nobody would have the same language. What are your feelings about that, Doug? Yeah, actually, I, I'm sympathetic with that concern uh, that all of mathematics is universal. I mean, um, all we need to have is uh, one internally consistent set of mathematics that maps onto the world adequately. Um, uh, now, uh, there's a mathematician uh, named Carl DeVito who suggested maybe what we have in common is counting. But beyond that, it really diverges. So it, let's imagine that's the case. Do we have to give up hope? I don't think so. Because then maybe the, the trick in creating a message is not to give them the mathematical concepts that they're already familiar with, but to introduce them step by step to our way, sort of help them reinvent our own mathematics. So I, I think there may be hope. Well, let me ask, just ask you then, do you believe that prime numbers are universal or, uh, I mean, platonic, or do, are they discovered? No, uh, I, I think uh, they are created, um, but uh, they're very useful. Uh, and, um, and I don't think the fact that something is created um, makes it second class. 
I think, you know, we create a lot of other good things too. So if we happen to have created our mathematics in cooperation with nature, uh, that works for me. Frank, are you ready? No, not yet. Give me uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, he says. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, why don't we have these two gentlemen say something in their own languages and cling on <laughs> so we can hear what it sounds like? Say hurry up, Frank, and cling on. Hurry up, yes, too. No, you say cling on, you can say that. I can go without presenting. Yeah, that's, can you speak cling on? You're supposed to say yes or no. How do you say no in cling on? bet. I'll just say, kalt e, maelan, welangate kame and wot, which means, hello, my friends. I see you all, and that's oh, C yeah, no. in the famous avatar sense. Let's just go and see you. Paul, one of the comments that you made uh, in saying how you just, uh, created your language, you wanted to create something that the sounds would have a nice feel, and I think you contrasted it potentially with Klingon. What, what, what would that sound like? What, okay. what, what, are, what are nice sounds in this engine? Right. First of all, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I hope it did not come off in any way as disparaging of Klingon. I mean, I mean, no, it's complimentary. OK, great. <laughs> Good. OK, OK. Uh, I don't know what nice means. And I think nice and beautiful is entirely in the ear of the beholder. So when I was given the task of creating a language that sounded nice, I said, OK, I'll just make something that sounds nice to me. And hopefully, it'll sound nice to other people, too. Uh, but you know, I think everybody's language sounds nice. And, I, and as a linguist, I think all languages sound nice. So Kind of leave it at that. And, you know, and Klingon was, was the other way around. It's supposed to be a language that sounds mean and tough. <laughs> but that's culturally bound. What sounds mean and tough to us as English speakers might not sound mean and tough to somebody who speaks Chinese or Swahili or something else. But since most of those Star Trek guys spoke English, I went with, I went with our culture, so <laughs> there you are. <laughs> <coughs> okay, Frank? Okay. <clears throat> we have this working now. And what I'm really going to be talking about now is the picture sequence that we have we put on the Voyager spacecraft. There are actually two Voyagers, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Both of them are now outside the solar system going outwards at 10 kilometers a second out into the galaxy. Uh, NASA invited us to put on the Voyager, and you see it on the screen here, a, some kind of a, a message for the extraterrestrials, and we chose to uh, being this, this was in the era 1977, make a long playing record for those of you who know what that is, <laughs> <laughs> which would describe our culture. We thought that was what the extraterrestrials would like to know about. And so there is a two hour long playing record on it. Uh, it's engraved in uh, aluminum and gold plated. So it's called the golden record and it's contained in a gold-plated box, and you see that on the side of the spacecraft here in this picture. Uh, I cannot see the screen, so if I'm describing something you're not seeing, please tell me, because I'll have no idea. I'm, <laughs> I'm not describing what's there. Uh, now, this was supposed to depict our culture in great detail, and so there are uh, several sections on it. One of them is greetings in 55 human languages, oral, which the extraterrestrials will not understand at all. They will get the image, one bit of information from this, and that is that we are a heterogeneous planet, that we have different, cult different groups, different uh, uh, cultures, and so forth, because there are these different languages. There are also 10 greetings from UN delegates uh, to the extraterrestrials uh, in an assortment of language, including even Esperanto, as they thought they chose some, something about the intellects of UN delegates that they thought, since Esperanto was to be a universal language, it must work on Alpha Centauri, too. <laughs> too. Uh, there is a long section of sounds of Earth uh, ranging all the way from uh, the pitter-patter of rainfall to the cry of a baby. Uh, but the, probably the thing that is most rich in real information is 112 television quality pictures of various parts of human culture. And that's what I wanted to really 
point out to you because this is really the high, oh, well, I'm, I forgot one other thing. There's also over an hour of music, both uh, classical music, popular music, folk music, Earth's Greatest Hits, that, that's what's on this record. Uh, but, <clears throat> but when it comes to information, there are 112 uh, television quality pictures, some in color, some not, for just lack of uh, bandwidth or information capacity on the disc. And these were assembled by a, a large committee of people, some of whom are here. And uh, the goal was to depict our culture thoroughly and accurately as much as you can in 112 images. Uh, there are interesting asides. Uh, we, we intended to be very honest about this, as well as comprehensive, but still some biases creep in. Uh, you, want to sh you find out you want to show our Earth is in the best possible light. So there's not very many ugly people shown uh, on, the, uh, on the thing. And we didn't show, uh, we didn't, there are some pictures which depict poverty, but most of, it predict, most of the pictures show fairly uh, high quality housing, cities, and such things. Uh, now, in picking out the pictures, we wanted to present facts about ourselves, and we wanted not to be confusing, and this is really my message today about the danger in constructing languages, even in the form of pictures. There is a very great danger of sending a picture which sends an incorrect image or incorrect information about us, uh, or one that is ambiguous. It's not clear what it is showing you. And I'm going to show you some examples of pictures that we considered putting on the record and then did not use because of the flaws I just mentioned. As well, as I'm going to show you some pictures that are on the record in which in retrospect were a big mistake. Uh, and that will tell something about us. <clears throat> so here, here's the spacecraft with the uh, golden disc on it. And here it is seen up more closely. It's a 12 inch record. The, you see a, the box with some diagrams on it. These diagrams tell you how to get, extract the information from the disc, how to play the music so that it comes out sounding like the music really sounds, that sort of thing. Uh, you'll see a square there with a circle in it. That's actually the first picture on the, in the picture sequence. And that's there so that the extraterrestrials will know when they're decoding it right because they will get an image that, which is on the cover. And there the problem is getting the aspect ratio of uh, four to three in this case uh, of the horizontal to vertical uh, uh, magnification in the pictures. This is the golden record just to show it uh, to you. Uh, there are four of these in existence, by the way. There's one on the Voyager 1, another one on the Voyager 2, another one in the White House, and the other in the National Archives. Uh, this shows it to you up close. And now, <clears throat> here's a picture we didn't put. I'm going to show you some examples of things we thought were bad pictures. Uh, this, of course, is a fascinating picture of a very unusual and spectacular tree, but it's not a typical tree. And so we thought this was not a good thing to send because it would be taken as an image of a typical tree on Earth, and that's just not true. And so this was not a good one to send. It is not on the record. Here's one, and here now you have to, if you can, uh, forget that you're a human being. You're no longer a human being. You're a 14-legged spider where you evolved from a 14-legged spider. And uh, <clears throat> what would you make of this picture? You've never seen a primate. You've never seen a mammal. What is this you're looking at? Now, to you, now before you became a 14-legged spider, oh, this is obvious. These are some dancers dancing. That's, there's Mikhail Baryshnikov and somebody uh, doing ballet. But to the 14-legged spider, they would say, oh, this is really puzzling. It looks like maybe it's one creature with two heads. Um, and, or maybe it's two creatures and they're fighting because it looks as though the male is somehow uh, uh, abusing the female in this picture. And so this is the kind of thing which 
should, should not be sent. It doesn't work. Uh, here's another one. <clears throat> this was used in this part of the sequence which was tried to show what medical uh, technology we had. It was supposed to show we have x-rays. But again, it's, not, it's uh, just not clear what, what this person is pointing at and the relationship to her. So this one was not used, but this is a similar one where it is probably obvious that the picture that is up there is an x-ray picture of the, the, the hand which is adjacent to it. So this one works and this one is on the record. Now here's one again, you, you primates will look at this and right away see that well there's some shepherds shepherding sheep. But if you don't have any context, the 14-legged spider is going to look at this and say, well, which ones are the intelligent ones? The ones in the, ones in the white suits? Or the ones in the red and black? Well, in the record, there are other pictures, of course, showing humans, which would, would uh, clarify the ambiguity which is present here. But that's something you have to watch for. There has to be something that resolves any ambiguity such as that. Here's another one. This one is on the record. Uh, it's obviously a dog and a person riding horseback, but again, it, this may be looked at and seen as a creature that has a very strange anatomy, anatomy with this white appendage which comes out of its back. You know. So this is on the record, but uh, it possibly will be in, misinterpreted. Uh, here we are with Jane Goodall in Africa. If you look at that, well, the question is, if you're a 14 legged spider, who is watching who? Uh, there's a clue that the, the ones we call humans have some kind of a machine which suggests they're really the observers, but it's not certain whether they're the observers or whether that thing that looks like a camera tripod is actually some kind of device which holds them in captivity so that the creatures in the foreground can enjoy uh, in them in this sort of uh, arboreal zoo. Uh, here's one, this one is on the record, as was the one I just showed you, uh, a frog in a person's hand. But there's not enough detail here to be sure that the frog is not a part of the person. It's, there's not enough detail so that you can tell that there's really two creatures involved here and not just one. Here's a really misleading one. We thought this was great. <laughs> Just picture all the extraterrestrials looking at this and saying, wow, they've got fish that can fly, but, they don't, but their wings are so small. How did they do it? But the atmosphere must be very thick for fish-like creatures to swim through the atmosphere, as you see here. Uh, this one is on the record. <laughs> Now this one's an interesting one because in uh, making the record, uh, we wanted to show, we unconsciously wanted to show the good side of human life. And so there's no war pictures. There's no atomic bomb picture on the record. And in fact, we, we unconsciously and to some extent consciously avoided anything that showed warfare or cruelty in human culture. This is the one slide which actually suggests that maybe uh, we, we are militaristic and have warfare. It's of course the Great Wall of China and there are the gun slits in the wall. If that's what they are, that's not, not clearly what they are. But uh, again, this is ambiguous. This is either just showing us a very interesting work of architecture or has a secret message that in fact warfare occurs among our people. This one was put in to deal with a problem you have when you actually show people and it is showing who is old and who is young. You would think that would be easy, but not necessarily. Uh, there are very old people in this picture, very young people, but which are which? If you're a 14-legged spider, how would you know? Uh, <clears throat> maybe we hatch out of eggs and we are very large. When we come out of the eggs and as time goes on, we get smaller and smaller. Uh, it's just possible, maybe on some planets, that is the way life goes. In the case of the Voyager record, this, was, this re ambiguity was resolved by adding a, a diagram such as this, which gives the people's age and, and actually weight also, uh, using a, a, 
symbolism which is established in some other slides that I have not showed you. That is the definition of the year and the kilogram are given elsewhere on the record. This one <coughs> uh, shows how we procure food, how we eat, but it, had, it has in it a, a very serious defect we realized way too late, and that is a, above the head of the woman you see two toy trucks. <laughs> and in a subsequent picture, which I won't show you, there are some, well, no, I'm, I'm gonna show you one. Uh, there are some big trucks. And the, you could look at this and decide, well, this is where trucks come from. <laughs> They're born small and they get big, and pretty soon <laughs> you have this. So you go to your grocery store and you buy trucks like loaves of bread and then you nurture them with something or other and pretty soon you've got a full-blown car or a bicycle or whatever the case may be. Now this one we thought was one of our best pictures and in retrospect is one of the worst. Take a look at it. What, what is conf what's possibly confusing here? What is wrong with this picture? There are actually at least two major flaws in this image. Now we thought it was great because it showed we had athletic events, it showed something of human anatomy. Uh, it had in it what were then considered the main examples of the main, uh, main racial groups of the earth. Uh, so we have the, uh, the famous um, Russian sprinter Valery Bortsov there and th three other people, one from Asia, some from Africa. We thought this was wonderful because it showed how we were ecumenical and had athletics and spectator sports. There are spectators in the background. But what's wrong? Anybody see anything wrong? There's no females. Well, there are females in other pictures, so that this, this, that's not too bad. I might say that the male... Um, they could be hunting, yes, this could be like gladiators. The last one across the finish line gets executed. You know. Or the first one. And, ah, I think you've heard me describe this before. <laughs> yeah, there are two major flaws. Uh, anybody else got any good ideas? That pardon? They're wearing numbers. Maybe all creatures on Earth have to wear identification numbers at all time. We're in some kind of uh, 1984 type style. <laughs> No, the, the main problem here is that uh, all four of them have one leg shorter than the other. Uh, and so does this mean there's actually a sub-race or something of creatures on this planet that run very fast but only have one leg? <laughs> and is that what this is about? And there's one other thing which I think is really neat. Anybody see it? Oh, you know, it was already named. If you look at them closely, they're all floating in the air. Their feet are not on the ground. And so not only do these creatures race very successfully on one leg, but they have an anti-gravity device. <laughs> and you can just see the scholars arguing over the deep significance of this and where is the anti-gravity device that is causing all of these creatures to be elevated above the ground. Uh, so those are examples of where you can go wrong. And then there, there's are just a couple of. Can we open for Q and A? Two more. I'm done. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we put this in just to show that humans are not infallible. <laughs> that mistakes are made. <laughs> and there it sits, and we wonder if it's still sitting there because clearly, it can't go forwards and it can't go backwards. And there are those people scratching their head at the, over the left, wondering what to do next. And finally. To, Here's a slide which probably won't be ambiguous. It, uh, <laughs> this was put in to show that humans are sometimes crazy. <laughs> and this is a very famous French mountain climber who is still alive, by the way, surprisingly. <laughs> uh, standing on a peak in the Alps. So those are examples of the way our human sense of what's in a picture can really distort our judgment and lead us to make use pictures which are don't work and how we may confuse the extraterrestrials. Thank you very much for this. Uh,
we have two roving microphones that we will uh, bring to the front. And if you have a question, please raise your hands. We have two over there and, and one over there. And we will alternate left, right, left, right. Yeah. Um, I, I figure that humans will recover Voyager in 100,000 years, more or less. Uh, what do you think the odds are that our great, great, great grandchildren will be able to figure those pictures out? <laughs> I think I think humans, uh, I mean, even many years from now, will be able to figure these out because what's happening in these pictures is is controlled by our anatomy, and I don't believe. Well, maybe I'm wrong. That our anatomy will change so much that it will look ridiculous. The, the, the people are doing the things in these pictures. I didn't show you some. We had some pictures of gymnasts in which we put, where they did actual gymnastics and we had time scales in them uh, to show how fast humans could do gymnastic stunts, if you will. Uh, and uh, I guess maybe I'm too conservative, but I think that will be understandable many, many years from now. Young woman, yes? This question sort of builds off of that because one thing that, unless human physiology changes that much, they'll have is eyes and stereo vision. And I was, I was wondering, in picking the pictures, what, if any, considerations were made for different visual systems and just the simple fact that we understand two-dimensional pictures to represent, you know, three-dimensional spaces? Uh, you've raised a criticism that has been made many times and is quite valid that uh, we're pre we presented two-dimensional pictures and maybe this, this works for us, but maybe not for everybody. Uh, for instance, dogs do not see two-dimensional pictures. And it could be that way with the extraterrestrials. So that what I've just shown you will only work with creatures whose visual systems work like ours. On the other hand, there are some cues in there to help them understand. So there's a picture of two hunters uh, and an antelope, and there are measurements that show the height of the hunters is the same as the height of the antelope, even though the antelope is a lot smaller. Uh, and so it shows that when we represent these 3D objects in a two-dimensional space, um, it follows certain conventions. So there's some, some clues. Okay. Yeah, I, I realize this would be a challenge no matter what technology you wanted to use, but when I look at how a phonograph record works, or worse would be, I guess, a DVD or something like a magnetic tape, why would we, I mean, how do we think um, anybody from a, a different society or a different technology would ever be able to unravel um, how to actually play these back? And then, of course, if you lay TV encoding on top of it, it really becomes kind of complicated, doesn't it? Uh, it only works for somebody who is, uh, has enough technology to uh, play a long playing record. Now, we did help them. We sent along a, st a stylus. We sent the record and a stylus. We didn't send a record player. But the stylus, uh, oh, and the, the uh, cover of the record shows the stylus being played on the record, and it shows the speed at which the record is to be turned uh, to make the sounds and music come out right. So you are told what to do, and now all you need is the electronics to amplify the electrical signal that comes out of the stylus, and you've got the result, the, the intended result. So they, they have to have the ability to do that, but uh, one, if they do, then they should very easily arrive at the correct uh, presentation of the data. No story ever read ever said you sent the stylus. That's Pardon? Yes. <laughs> Going back to how to create an alien language, can you comment on how you think J.R. Tolkien might have approached the matter? I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm sorry. We didn't. Going back to how to create an alien language, how do you think J.R. Tolkien might have approached the matter? Tolkien. He would have pr approached it. Oops. He would have approached it, I think, exactly, exactly the way he did. Uh, what he did that was different from what Paul and I did, I think, certainly different from what I did, is, is he had a whole very elaborate, not just a language, he had languages 
uh, that were related to each other and, and, and that grew out of each other and things like that. He had this whole complex system, and that's why he wrote the book, so that the languages had some place to be used as opposed to the other way around. But uh, so his, his was more his historically rich, actually, than, than what I did and maybe than what you did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually haven't looked at Tolkien's languages much, and perhaps some of you know, uh, know better than I do, but I think uh, his languages are tied closer to Earth languages mm -hmm. than what, what you and I did. Yeah. And I was wondering, uh, we know it's really easy with, for instance, the pioneer plaque to go from image to math, and then the aliens could make their own language discerning it. What about, is there any research being done now with different cultures on Earth and their different dialects and languages on making those mathematical, and if there's any universal mathematics within those languages that apply to all of them? Well, there, there uh, is an area of linguistics in looking at the um, underlying structure that all languages need to have. The, so the surface characteristics may vary distinctly, but there are certain characteristics that any language needs to have. So I, th I would think that would be one area that would get at that. So in closing, I have to remind you again that uh, there is this table where you can buy uh, this particular <laughs> session on DVD or any other session of uh, these two days. Thank you very much to the panel for <laughs> intimidating. And thank you to all these viewers.